Dave Rubin, who has worked for us on and off for, for years. And 1989. 1989. Wow. And, as many of you know, uh, artist in many ways, music, drawing, painting, and more. And um, tonight we're going to learn a little bit more about Chuck's label, too. <laughs> so without further ado, Thank you for coming. My name's Chuck Seidel. I think I know most everybody in the room. This man, who's the center of attention tonight, is Dave Rubin. And I'm supposed to talk about an hour, or he's supposed to talk about an hour. And it's uh, so it's about an hour, and it's about Dave. So I, um, I think everybody here probably, as we get going, is going to have a question that we need to ask this man. This is the forum. He has to answer truthfully tonight, and he's sober. So <laughs> I don't like truth or dance. No, no, no. Let me have my time, okay? All right, so anyway, so we have about an hour, and I'd like to really, in that time, understand where he came from, kind of the nuts and bolts university type stuff, you know, facts and figures, but this is one of the most curious, interesting people in town. If we could figure out what makes him tick, you know, that, of course, nobody's going to do that, but if we could really kind of get down to... I've seen him so passionate, so curious about things. What really makes this guy work is is great, and he's got some obscure thing he wants to read here, which is indicative of exactly the way he operates. So, Dave. Thank you. I'm jokingly going to call us a benediction because it's about Benedictine monks that had the volume called The Nature of Things it was written by Lucretius, almost 1500 BC. It was written in a form of a poem, but where he suggests that we're all made out of the same thing, like even the metaphor is atoms. We're all made out of the same thing in different configurations. But this was the only copy of it. And this book is about this man named Poggio. He used to be one of the copiers who left uh, uh, under a pope's administration. He left. And he went looking. He wanted to go looking through the monasteries, trying to find these lost volumes. And he discovers this poem by Lucretius, The Nature of Things. But I haven't gotten to that part yet. He's just arriving at the... Uh, now, we monastery. only have an hour. You know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just want to read this as a benediction for this conversation. That's what this was billed as, a conversation with you. There was yet another time in which the Benedictine rule called for reading. Every day at meals, one of the brothers was assigned on a weekly basis to read aloud. Benedict was well aware that for at least certain of the monks of this assignment would occasion pride. And he therefore tried to suppress the sensation as best he could. Quote, let the incoming reader ask all to pray for him so that God may shield him from the feeling of elation. Unquote. He, I'm not asking him to do that. He was, he was aware, too, that for others, the readings would be an occasion for mockery or simply for chat, unless you want to do that. And here, too, the rule made careful provision, quote, that there be complete silence, no whispering, no speaking. Only the reader's voice should be heard there. But above all, he wanted to prevent these readings from provoking discussion or debate. No one should presume to ask a question about the reading or about anything else lest occasion be given. Those words were not to be questioned or contradicted, and indeed all contention was in principle to be suppressed. As the listing of punishments and the influential rule of the Irish monk Columbanus, born in the year of Benedict, Benedict died, makes clear lively debate, intellectual or otherwise, was forbidden. To the monk who has dared to contradict the fellow monk with such words as, quote, it is not as you say, there is a heavy penalty in a position of silence or 50 blows. These are all meant to affirm unambiguously that these pious communities were the opposite of the philosophical academies of Greece or Rome, places that had thrived upon the spirit of contradiction and cultivated a restless, wide-ranging curiosity. Learn, engage, change. <laughs> <laughs> or may want to know Dave in the future, this is an important demonstration right now. What's your point? 
Wait, not everybody may have this point. Isn't it obvious what the point is? We're here in a library that's allowed. All right, take a take a vote. Who knows exactly what you're talking about? <laughs> All right, we got one. This is listed. This was billed as a conversation. It, the conversation wasn't even allowed. This is a library that does try to replicate the uh, uh, academic academies of Greece and Rome. I just want, at the beginning of this presentation, this conversation, just appreciate that. <laughs> All right, there's the point, right there. <laughs> Thank you to the university. In other words, that's why I said learn and game change. That's the model here, which is what mm -hmm. this encouraged. Okay, go ahead. So why don't we do what, the, get the boring stuff out of the way. Why don't you give us a timeline of where the hell you came from, what brought you to town, how old you are, just kind of work to the last 90 years, will you? <laughs> Can you do that in three or four minutes? I'm All right. Start. Okay, go ahead. Dave and I have known each other for a long time, so. Yeah. I was born in a house that my father did not build. <laughs> this, is, this is four minutes worth, right? Yeah, okay. it was the Fitch Sanitarium across the street from the uptown entrance to NYU campus. This is in New York? Yeah, New York, in the Bronx. All right, in the Bronx. Fitch Sanitarium. Yeah. On July 20th, which later was to become the famous day that man landed on the moon. This was the day I landed on the earth. July 20th, 1952, I'm 62 years old. Okay, there's, is there more after that? <laughs> 62 years, roughly. All right, so you went to high school there? Come on, we need yeah, the basics. Yeah, well, yeah, lived in the Bronx, and um, moved to Westchester when I was eight, and went west for the first time. Turned eight in Berkeley. Turned eight years old in Berkeley? Yeah, California. Huh. That was pretty cool. And you finished high school? 1960. Did what? you finish high school? Oh. <laughs> I did take a course there. My dad was doing ex working at Livermore. Really? really? Yeah. So you finished high school, I take it? Yeah. All right. Did you go to college? Not really. No college. <laughs> any, any, uh, what got you interested in music? When did this whole music thing start? What started that? Well, my mom plays piano. My dad loves music, loves music, so it was, you know, paintings on the wall. And uh, your first instrument? Was the uh, clarinet. Really? And you still play the clarinet? Okay. Any music questions? So you guys need to save your questions if you'll have chances. Any music questions for Dave? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. There's one. What is it? Well, I had a college question. Okay. Didn't you How kind of go to teach you in a college? Yeah. Didn't no, you? no, I, we're, 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 we, we haven't left the 50s. Or the, didn't, you, <laughs> didn't you kind of go to college? No. Well, you know, I lived, I lived at Bard College for a while. There you go. So I did go there. <laughs> You're talking about the sourdough now? No, no, oh, Bard, Bard College. Oh, Bard. I think it's Bard. Where Ray and Michelle's daughter, Karina, graduated from. But I tried, that was my college experience, but I was just sort of... I actually ended up after like two years. I had my own. I had two rooms: one in Stone Row, and then one in, in the barracks, which aren't here anymore. But I had. I was actually there. I used to go to classes. I did some artwork for the. So you actually went to Bard College. Oh, no, I, I wasn't enrolled. Not okay. when <laughs> That was my college experience. <laughs> a lot of it was music because I was playing with a band. And at what? How old were you in your, your first band? Um, I mean, there's some kind of band, yeah, I guess, you know, 19 or 20. You're 20 years old. So you were in Livermore? No, that was, I was eight. Okay. My dad was in Livermore. Where were you when you graduated from high school? Ardsley. Ardsley, New York. It's 20 miles. It was once in the newspaper. The epicenter for the earthquake was 20 miles north of Times Square. That's Ardsley. Ardsley, New York, named for Ardsley, England. The Cyrus Field that laid the cable under the thing, under the, uh, he lived next to Arsley, and they had a chain, forget it. Anyway, what, oh, it was in 19, um, uh, 19, uh, 80 something, maybe. It had to be 80. Might be between 80 and 83. And there was an earthquake in New York, and the epicenter was Arsley. Arsley was the camp, George Washington's camp for the entire Continental Army. I'm serious was on our hill. 
Where the, where the, where the football field was. And so you stayed, that's where you graduated from high school, yep. and you stayed there for a couple years after high school. Yeah, we moved upstate and we were playing music around Bard College. And because a couple of the people in the band were graduated. What was the name of the band? Tattoo. Well, Skywheel. Skywheel. And it became Tattoo. Yeah, that's how it came up here, Tattoo. All right, so you're 20, you're still in New York, you've got going with the band, and then when did Tattoo grow wings and start moving west? Oh, no, that, that group, we went west in 25, when I was 25, 1976, the year of the dragon. And we lived in Berkeley from 76 to 80. We used to play on campus and we had a band, and that was a nine-person band. We'd play on the street, on the wharf in San Francisco, or in clubs around there and on campus in Berkeley. And that was a great experience. And then the band broke into three parts and the acoustic. I always said the migration, the hippie migration from New York is you go west, you go to the Bay Area, and then you either make a left and go south to LA, depending on your personality and what you're looking for, or right and go to Oregon. You know? We made the right and went to Oregon because we were the folk part of the of the group. And that was uh, that's how I eventually came up here. And you were playing acoustic? guitar in that Yeah, band. like the group I came up with. And so 76 to 80 or so, you're on the West Coast. We were playing electric and acoustic. And when did you come to Alaska? 1983. 1983. And what happened between 80 and 83? You were in Oregon? Yeah. Playing? Yeah, well, the dude, we were a three-person band at that point. Trombone, acoustic uh, uh, guitar, and stand-up bass. And so, sometimes the drums. those of you that know Dave, quite often the world's going to fall down that instant. In other words, there's some mini drama going on, and uh, he was, we were going to do a project together, and Dave was like, this will never work, we're all going to die, this is just impossible. And I was reaching for some sort of metaphor on why this was not a big deal, so I said, come I was on. working for you this summer. All right. I was nervous about it, came to the office, I said, Chuck, I don't know if I can do this, really. Really, but it, it was going on for like hours, but anyway. <laughs> I was looking for a metaphor of why this is really no big deal. So he says, for God's sake, Dave, it's not like you're opening for the Grateful Dead. And he looked at me and says, yeah, I did that in 1982. <laughs> so I said, all right, that's it. I'm done talking to you. So. But I would like to hear more about that because I walked away at that point. So what actually happened with the Grateful Dead? <laughs> well, <coughs> you're encouraging me to do this. The only letter we got as a complaint from a tourist to this summer was about they were met by a very rough looking gentleman tour guide on the dock and then he talked a little bit about you, you, you memorized that complaint. But spent the this is the letter that came from, from uh, Holland America but spent the whole time talking about this band he was in and how they opened for the script. Dave actually narrated this dinner service we had and did a wonderful job at it but we literally get this well articulate terrible complaint on him and about three quarters of the way through us about some guy who's wanted to talk about the Grateful Dead. So we looked at each other and right simultaneously, they don't like the Grateful Dead. This doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, the people's name was Angle. <laughs> <laughs> just like these people's angle on, on me. So I, so I just it. it was the only complaint. Other people liked it. What are you talking about? I had people ask me about it. So tell us about opening for the Grateful Dead. I'm interested in that. What do we hear is the big names and all that stuff? No, no, that's not true. <laughs> We're interested, right? The Grateful Dead? Come on. <laughs> Well, we moved to Oregon, the folk faction, and we had this we had this idea we wanted to find Ken Kesey, because we knew Ken Kesey lived in Oregon. So you were on a search for Ken Kesey? Well, we went, you know, we went west, we went to the Bay Area, Berkeley, because we were kind of, we were into the Grateful Dead, into that way of playing and way of living kind of thing. And, you know, he was at the heart of that, and we figured we were going to move to Oregon for the same reasons that, you know, he chose to live in Oregon and not stay in the city, you know. So we were playing up in the uh, Saturday market in Eugene. We started, get, started to get to know Eugene, which was pretty cool for us. <laughs> and uh, playing Saturday market. And we find out about the uh, country fair, the Oregon country fair. So we figured, oh, we, we're playing, we're living down in Medford, though. This is an hour, Medford's an hour and a half south. We're like way down there by uh, Ashland. We used to play in Ashland, so people know Ashland. But, um, so we find out at the country fair we got to play there, and then we go find out. We find out Ken Kesey comes and always hangs out on Sundays from the fair, at the fair, 
by his brother's frozen yogurt stand. <laughs> of course. Because well, his obvious, brother was yeah. Chuck Easy, who was the owner with his wife of Springfield Creameries, Nancy's Yogurt. With the, with the fruit on top, separate thing. That's Chuck Kesey. By the way, their dad was Fred Kesey, who started Dairy Gold. Chuck Kesey's Dairy Gold. So anyway. <laughs> so, so we find out he's going to be, and the yogurt stand is right by the energy center. They are in Country Fair. It's like a figure eight cut through the woods outside in Benita, outside of Eugene, about. And off the figure eight are these little cul-de-sacs of exhibits and all kinds of things. And this one was called the Energy Center. It was a clearing with exhibits and little, you know, lean-tos that were built for the weekend. All around, in the center was this giant windmill made out of branches and stuff. You know, it was the Energy Center. And the frozen yogurt stand was at one of the, right on the corner of the figure eight and the cul-de-sac of the Energy Center. So we booked ourselves there Sunday morning. And we're standing right at the Energy Center, and all of a sudden we're playing, but, oh my God. <laughs> it was Ken, yeah, Ken was standing there, I'm like, holy crap, that's him. And he's like just standing and beaming and smiling at us. It's like, he had just come back, like a day, maybe the day before, or a day or two before. Just come back from Skagway. He had been kicked off the set and out of the town. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Anybody in Skagway? Everybody? Yes. Yeah. Now you can stand at the head of the street, coming from the dock. You look down the street, on your left is the Red Onion Saloon. Mm -hmm. Now a little bit further down is the Golden North Hotel. There's that big turret. There's three stories, and it's got a golden cupola on top. Imagine, if you will, hanging out of the third story window. You're coming down the street like, there's someone hanging out of the window. What, what is going on? And then you, it's the director of the movie Never Cry Wolf. One star in Farley Moat about the research done up in the Yukon. They thought the wolves were decimating the caribou herd. It wasn't so. But what else could the wolves live on? Well, he set up his tent. And the next thing he went out for the day, came back, was filled with field mice. And that's what the wolves were living on, living on, on field mice. Anyway, so they're making the movie. And the base of operation was in, was in Skagway. So they're all staying, and they invited Ken to write a scene for the, for the screenplay. And he came up with this story where this Eskimo takes off his gloves with the hands still inside, throws them in a pond. And later on, they're chasing the protagonist up a path, frozen. But he, he after his son Jed died, he kind of, but he tried to take over every place, he, every room he walked into. And so he was trying to take over this movie. So I said, it was the director of the movie, begging Mr. He was drunk out of his mind, begging Mr. Kesey that if he didn't leave the set and preferably the town, he was going to kill himself. He jumped out the window right there. Well, we were. Mr. Well, Kesey agreed to leave town, and a couple of days later met us and was standing there watching us <laughs> play with a big smile on his face. But did you open for the Grateful Dead? I'm getting close. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. So, go ahead. Where was I? <laughs> There's a guy drunk and hanging out of a three-story right. window in Skagway. A couple of days later, there he is, standing like this, looking at us, and we're freaking out. And afterwards, he comes up, shakes your hand, invites us to come inside, sit in the tent with him, and you know, kind of hang out with the big chief in the tent. And he told us, he says, "I just got back from Alaska." He says, "You guys." You have to go to Alaska. They would love you guys there. He goes, I'll meet you in Skagway next Christmas. So, okay, that's our goal. You know, we haven't been to Alaska, we're living in Oregon. So then, we were gonna play again, and I, I had to run and get a drink of water. So maybe we played again. And I'm gonna get a drink of water, I'm really hoarse, which I'm getting to again. But, I hear there's a tap on my shoulder. I turn around and I look, and there's this woman with a pith helmet on, like a safari hat, big smile, <laughs> a whistle, a clipboard, you know, there's a polo shirt, a little insignia, Bermuda shorts, and these socks, sneakers. She was like the head counselor of the hippie camp out in the woods, you know? 
And she goes, she goes, <laughs> she's the head counselor. That's what she looked like. Okay. And uh, she goes, who do I talk to about booking your band? I said, can you talk to me? She goes, yeah, we'd, we'd really like you to open for the Grateful Dead. She goes, hi, I'm Carolyn Adams. I went, mountain girl. This was Jerry Garcia's wife. But they weren't together because they were strange, but they were still married. I couldn't believe it. Well, she said, she said, my name is Carol Adams. I said, Mountain Girls, I knew the, the history. So I, I, she, I said, you better come over and repeat that for these guys. Okay. They're not going to believe, <laughs> believe me at all. So PZ was talking to the rest of the band. We come back, and I, I said, you guys, you guys, listen, listen this, is, this is Carol Adams. This is Mountain Girls. Here. And she asked me, well, why don't you guys don't for the Grateful Dead? They're going to be playing here at the end of the summer, and we're, you know, we'd like some local acts, plus we're going to, Robert Cray, the blues guy, he was one of the opening acts too. He wasn't, he was just about getting famous, he was playing in Eugene a lot. And uh, it was us, Strangers with Candy, this band from Seattle that was playing at the fair, and Robert Cray, and then Peter Rowan from Olden in the Way. He was the only other person allowed up on the Grateful Dead stage, which was just gigantic. It was like 12 foot high, it was just the stage. And then what I'd say, it was like a skyline of of amplifiers and equipment. From a distance, it must have looked like a city, like over the trees. It was it was, it was the biggest touring sound system yet devised by humankind. I'm serious, that's a fact. It was the biggest, and this was it. And we were on a flatbed truck with a local sound system right next to it. And Peter Rowan was the only part of the opening act because he was in a band with Terry Garcia, old in the way, the bluegrass. He was allowed to get up there, and he was the last opening act he played by himself with a guitar. Then the Grateful Dead. Now the Grateful Dead, this was a 10 year anniversary of the 72, this was 82. 72 concert, which they now sell DVDs of, it was an epic concert. It was a reunion between <coughs> the Grateful Dead and Ken Kesey and the people who went back to Oregon from San Francisco to live more, because the Grateful Dead went off and did the tour. And this was a, a reunion for them, 72. Not long after 67, 68. And so then we were the 10 year anniversary of that. But by now, Terry Garcia wasn't even talking to the rest of the band. And we had an inside story on that because a friend of ours was their sound man for their monitor system. He had designed it from Artsley. And he was on tour with them. And he said, yeah, it's a really great scene. Garcia's not even talking to anybody in the band. He's just locking himself in his room. And, you know. and uh, so they what, what year was that? So 82. 82. So they, they quit early. So Kesey, who said, Dave, the band's quit. He says, get the guys up together and get back up there. I got the local guy to leave up one mic on the open, on the flatbed. So luckily Ken was there to see this poetically. But imagine, here you got this giant, like a spaceship of sound equipment. <laughs> left completely silent and helpless because the crew is a bandit ship and it can't generate its own sound. And then one microphone, one concession to, you know, entire, entire advancement of humankind. <laughs> okay, well, here's a microphone. And four acoustic instruments. He said, get back up there, get back up there. Because he said they took down the whole PA and he got him to leave up one microphone. Keys, he begged him. Because he didn't want the party to stop because he did. Quit early. The other concert went on until midnight, the one that they sell the DVD of. So anyway, so we get back up there, you know, the four acoustic, got trombone, acoustic guitar, stand-up bass, and a little drum set, snare drum and a hi-hat, gather around the one microphone. <laughs> and Kizzy's out by the soundboard and, and the crowd, and we start playing, and he's jumping up and down, because like, we were like instruments of his own personal triumph, you know? Because <laughs> <that moment. laughs> the Grateful Dead had completely rebuked him. During halftime, he went, he tried to go into their backstage prefab little area, and me and Nora were watching, and he walks in with a guy with a video camera behind him, and then came walking out right away. We go, he wasn't in there too long. I found out later at Casey's house, I asked him, what happened? He goes, you saw that? He goes, yeah. I said, you know, we, he hadn't seen that in a while either. He said, he said, that was one of the most painful things that ever happened to me. So if I went in there, someone said, oh, here come the vultures. You know, the Grateful Dead got started with Keezy the Acid Test, you know, in San Francisco. That really hurt him. But, so us, 
So them abandoning the stage and, and the folk thing coming through and saving the day was his own personal, you know. Well, that's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions before we move on? Something you're burning to know about Mr. Rubin? All right, we have 30 years. Yes. I have one music question. It's not so much about your past, but just what you think. Um, it sounds like, obviously, I didn't know this, but yeah, you opened the Grateful Dead. Of course, I've heard your Hendrix story. Not oh, you want to hear that? No, 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 hold on. We have to go. <laughs> hold on. We've got 30 <laughs> years from 1982 to get to the present. Just a, just a question. Oh, is it Woodstock? You want to hear? What? No, hold on. <laughs> hold on just a second. Not what have you seen, but what do you think about the way that popular music, what's on the radio now, what the youth listens to now, what people who are trying to do what you did back then are doing now. How do you feel about the direction of pop music and where it's going? Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know I, I'm play, I drive around a lot with jazz. And we talk about this because, you know, we're in a band that where it's people from your generation that are making a point of, like, I'm not making a point, just happen really getting into, like, that music, you know, besides doing new stuff. So, I mean, he, what he thinks is goes, be, oh, be, uh, because I've been riding around listening to these Woodstocks. See, Ray Lipinski dropped off the whole set of the entire Woodstock concert. We've been listening to it. He said, he said, yeah, the words were amazing. He said, I turned Chaz on to the Grateful Dead this summer. I said, I'm going to put it on and just have, be in a jam, see what he thinks. And he goes, he goes I said, this is the Grateful Dead. He goes, Ooh, go for a while. He goes, Ooh, these aren't your, like, stock classic rock riffs, are they? I don't know. And he goes really friendly. He goes, wow, this is really cool. He says, I can see myself being involved in the jam. Like, you know, so it was really cool. I don't know. What, whatever that was, it wasn't just that way to us. Whoever hears it, you know, kids, little kids love the Beatles. You know, when they hear it, it, was just, it really was. It wasn't just, I mean, when you hear Swing and Dixieland, you know, you love it. You know, and you hear, you know, when you hear classical, you love it. But it was a major thing that happened. It was it was gigantic. It's still resounding. And the Beatles, I think, are still the top selling like CDs. Continuous the envelope just it's a resounding gong, you know, like wow, 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 and just keeps expanding. You know. That's what I want to hear. The, the gong analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can take that home with you. Yeah. yeah. All right. So it's 1982. And you come to catch a can in 83. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is we're halfway through our time, so we need to get to 2014 so we can move into some of this other stuff. So in 83, you come to town? Yes. With Tattoo? With Tattoo and along with uh, Ray and Hall, too. Class of 83. Really? <laughs> yep, Hall Anderson, Ray Thomas. It's the same year. Wow, you guys made a big... Uh... Right there. And Greg, too. <clears throat> so when you played, uh, where did you play? Puppets. Oh, yeah. Too. <laughs> Where? Where did sourdough? Yeah, for which, by the way, I ask anybody here. Has every, anybody here been to the sourdough bar? No. Come on, everybody. Been to sourdough, right? I, 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 I propose that you could walk in there right now, walk up to someone old, young, and go, "Isn't this place pretty much exactly the same as it was the first time you ever walked?" Except in nobody's smoking. That's Except no one's smoking. <laughs> and you, anybody would look around and go, "Yeah, I guess it is." If they were here last summer working in the cannery of fishing to some old fisherman who's pissed off that he can't smoke in there anymore. Yeah, it is, because it is. I mean, sourdough, it's amazing. So, it's you've been in Ketchikan from 83 to 2014, 31 years, and in that period of time there's all sorts of art, Half all sorts of life. Half your life. So, what, uh, uh, go through the music side of things, because I don't want to miss the art thing, the, the your other mediums do, so. Walk through 30 years of music. Just give us a five minute where you played, what you played, what band you played in. Give us the 30 year music summary in Catch a Can. Can you do that? In well, a few minutes? Like five minutes? <laughs> well, after Fred and Leslie left uh, Catch a Can, Fred was a trombone player, and Leslie played piano. Something. And he was the original tattoo. He was an original tattoo, part of the group that opened And there were three of you. And we, but there was three, and then there was four with Rick playing drums. That's who mm -hmm. came to town. Mm -hmm. Four of us. All right. That's a great story that day. Arctic was the first place we ever played out on the deck, outside. In 83? Yep. And so, is that how you're making your living? 
No, then we want to go speak to the folks so up the street, play there. You and played then, in the folks hall? Yep, same oh. day. It's the same day. We got off the ferry, came downtown, and we, we asked some uh, hippie looking types, hey, where should we play? So you guys should go down to the Arctic. So we went down to the Arctic, and people sitting out on the deck, smoking. And so you out. just walked into town with your instruments and went straight to the Arctic? Well, when we were living in Oregon, if we didn't have a gig on a Friday or a Saturday night, we would go out questing. And we would drive through the back roads and go into bars and go, hey, you want some music? We just have these acoustic here, no sound system. We pass the hat. If you hate us, you can throw us out. And we used to get old gigs like this. So we went on a giant quest to, to Alaska to, well, to meet Ken. Ken, you know, but we got to the border in Canada. And this is the next spring, 83. We get to the border and we didn't have $500 between us. And they wouldn't let us across the border. So I called Ken on a, on a Friday afternoon, on a, on a Thursday afternoon. No, Friday, because the bank was open Saturday. Friday, I had to say, Ken, they won't let us across because we thought we were still going to meet him in Skagway. And he goes, Dave, i got 20 minutes to get to the bank. He's in Springfield. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll wire the money. She so did it, hung up, and went flying there. The money was there the next morning. We slept in the park and, and uh, playing. <laughs> and, uh, the next morning, $500, and we went to, up, came to catch him. This is the story, came to catch him. Went up to Skagway. So, was this whole questing thing, did it go on for a while? Did you, like, beg? Your way around well, we the bars for like 10 we, years, or? Well, we went to Skagway, we got a job playing in the, at the Red Onion. We did the same thing, went up there and played. We played on the ferry. But then they liked it so much sourdough. They said, what are you guys doing? They said, we're going up to Skagway. So we're on the way back, stop here and play. We know they got us a PA and everything. We made a big sign, tattoo. A sign and a PA, wow. Yeah. <laughs> we, left on, we left on July 3rd. We, 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 no, no, we played on July 3rd. We left on July 4th night. We couldn't play July 4th. They really wanted us to play July 4th. But we were leaving on the ferry. It was a Wednesday. And Going which direction? So we're heading south. And, we were, and I was looking at this town, Ketchikan, from the ferry before it went behind Panic. Looking at this town with a beautiful night with Deer Mountain lit up, fireworks. I'm going, this place is completely unbelievable. And then we went behind and then we went to New York, went questing all the way across the country. Got set, got to in your own rig? Are you driving a, like a Volkswagen van or something? My friend must have a Volkswagen van with a chimney coming out the top. With a wood with a stove. Stove. Oh, I knew it. Did you take your PA or did you leave that the soda? We didn't need it. Okay. So how long were you questing across the United States? It was that same. We got we in 83. We came up in the spring in June. Went to Skagway for solstice, 21st, I guess. All right. Came back, went back to Oregon. Got in our cars and went to New York, questing along the way, stopping in bars and playing. And then we got to New York, <clears throat> we got to Washington Square Park, our dream, our vision. This is always music in Washington Square Park, acoustic music. So we get there on the Friday night, Nora. Now Nora is my daughter's mother. She's a Siberian Yupik Eskimo girl from St. Lawrence Island, the village of Savunga. In fact, Adrian's with her right now in Anchorage. I had to leave here this morning. She said she was crying that takeoff was the worst she's ever been in her life. Anyway. <clears throat> Who's crying, your daughter or your ex-wife? No, no, Nora. Oh. So your daughter went to take no, off. Nora, Nora was pregnant, and I was bringing her home to meet my mother and father. Okay, so, so Nora's pregnant in New York. I, I bring her from, from Oregon to New York, questing all the way. With and a pregnant get, Eskimo yes. headed to New York. Yes. Okay. So then we get to um, New York. We get, we're so excited. We're going down to go play and uh, Washington Square Park. And we hadn't been there in a while, so Tom didn't get off at the uh, 110th Street Bridge, 100, 100, and uh, 147th Street Bridge. And we start heading south of the Major Deacon into territory, having grown up there and had never been to before. And this is Nora, who was born in St. Lawrence Island in the middle of the Bering Sea, her first trip to New York. So, so I was living in Westchester, it's a suburb, so she came to the suburbs first. She saw the city from a distance, but so we're heading into the city, and all of a sudden, all of us are, for the first time in our lives, including us, who grew up there in the South Bronx. And that's what Nora, it was amazing to me, like, this is what she's seen first, along with us. We've never seen it either. And it was like India, because I'd been to India. I'd never seen a part of New York like this ever in my life. So what happened? We made it through there, thanks to Tom. We got, we got to set Washington Square Park. And we're about to play right at the foot of the arch. And the police come up and go, sorry, 
An ordinance was just passed the week preceding. No horns or drones allowed in the park <laughs> anymore after hundreds of something years. So did you play acoustic we guitar? We walked down Dillow Street, which is right off the park. First annual Bob Dylan Imitators Contest. <laughs> is this a true story? Because these are a bunch of people you're lying to. <laughs> Friend, potential friends. All things considered. Did you actually participate in that? We signed up because we did a song called Wicked Messenger. Okay. You walk through this little Greek restaurant where people, the chefs were behind the counter with glass case, tables along the wall, really narrow. Go through it, opens up into this little beautiful theater with this red curtain, a round stage, seats all around, sunken down, right inside this big building, through this restaurant. And they're holding the first annual Bob Dylan Entertainment Center. You know, for all things considered, MBR's app was there. <laughs> they only stayed until half, they didn't stay to hear the judging. Who did the, And the people from NPR. But <clears throat> this DJ from WBAI, which was the underground FM station in New York, he was there. I think, I'll tell you about that. But, so anyway, so we played with the only serious band. Everybody else was doing his voice, imitating him, and singing. One song that was done with one of his characteristic voices with a different voice. You know, just everybody was being funny. But we were serious. Oh, yeah, um, Fred was his hair, as far as, because usually it was just one person doing him, but it was four of us. So we said, well, Fred, who had a big, uh, you know, he was Dylan. Jufro, had, he was Bob Dylan's hair. Were you the Bob Dylan's voice, no, but he was there? I was Alan Ginsberg. Oh. <laughs> Rick, so, so what happened Rick, there? What happened there? Rick was Bob Dylan's nose. Okay, what happened Tom there? Was the we won. You won? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, all right. So here's here. Well, I'm supposed to be done in 20 minutes. That ain't going to happen. We're only through 1984, and we've got 30 years to go. But I'll get done as quick as we can. So what happened? You, you won the Bob Dylan look-alike. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, Right. <laughs> And this guy from BAI asked us to come on his show on Saturday morning, New York City. Did you go? He called back and said, I didn't realize it, guys. I'm sorry. It's Hiroshima Day. <laughs> we got all kinds of programs, help, you know, dedicated. You know, I can't. He says, can you come on my other, my weeknight show starting at midnight? So we did that. And that was people were calling in and telling all the stories and stuff. And that was crazy. We played. And then we, well, we, came, back to, we came back to Oregon. I said, I'm moving up. I'm so moving where up. was Adrian, your daughter, born? I, I'm so, I, I can't believe it. I said, you guys, I'm moving to Ketchikan. I'm Did going you, back where to was your daughter born? In Ketchikan. Oh, I said, cool. Nora wants to have a baby in Alaska. She just wants to have a baby in Oregon. And I was getting to I said, I'm going back there. By yourself? Well, I went, Nora, yeah, I did, Nora, yes, Nora. Originally, initially. Um, so you came back in 84? No, we came back as a band. From, no, no, we came back up. No, no, I called Zig. I called the sourdough from my parents' house in New York. And Zig said, where are you guys? I said, I'm in New York. And my parents said, come back here, man. Everybody's asking about it. He says, come, we'll pay your way. You can pay us back from playing. He said, I'll get your ferry tickets. You can stay in my apartment. He got his tickets to the sauna and everything at the, at the high school, the, to the, you know, the pool and everything. He gave us his Jeep, and we stayed up in, at the Freer's house, which is up on the hill, up behind you guys, up above, up, you know, where Matt Freer used to live. In. This is 84. <laughs> this is still 83. It's still 83. Yeah. <laughs> so we come back and we play, and I go, guys, I'm staying here. I'm staying here. I'm, I'm moving here. And, and Zig gave me, and, and Larry, Gave me a job in the liquor store, and Nora came up. We had Adrian here in November, and uh, has been home ever since. Yeah, and it's amazing. Nora, Adrian just flew to Anchorage to be with her mom because her grandmother, her Siberian Yupik grandmother, died just a few days ago. Oh, uh, it's good that your daughter got a chance to go. Yeah. Any questions for Dave before we move on? <laughs> All right. So, so when did? So what was what's music been about for the last for the last thirty years? I remember you in the Potlatch, Potlatch Forever. Potlatch band, yeah. Potlatch yeah. band forever. Right, right. Were you doing anything? Was it you know, straight from the tattoo to the Potlatch? The tattoo. We picked up a local people in the name of Cactus Davis. You might remember Cactus? He became our drummer. Yeah. Graduated from from high school, Ketchikan High School. Was under Roy McPherson, and he was. And then with um, Anita Ray, who had been part of North. But Cactus, I realized, was the first Ketchikan High School graduate that I was destined to 
we don't have this music as far as with music in this town. Cactus was the first of like the younger people that I, I play with a lot. Patrick, was really and he was part of Tattoo. Yeah, he was became part of a band travel with Southeast. He was in Skagway when we went back. And, and uh, that was amazing. So guitar then, Potlatch Band, that was next. Okay. And the Potlatch Band, it's kind of still around, but it's yeah, well, it went on for twenty years or so, right? And for those of you younger folks, this town, for a long time, the bars didn't close till 5. When I was in the flying business, we used to come to work at 5.30 in the morning, and the town would have 200 drunks getting out of the bars <laughs> on Sunday morning, eventually making their way down to the air taxis. It was an entirely, it was a drinking town. This was a drinking, partying, I've never fighting seen town. i like this in my life. We were playing a sourdough. <clears throat> we came from Oregon, and I'm from New York. And people would come, it was packed, but people would start leaving at like quarter to 12 ago. They're not going home to sleep, are they? Where are they going? Well, I met this guy down in Oregon where we lived who was a chef at the fireside. And he told me, Dave, he says, you gotta come up to Kev's Camp. We also met this other family, he used to go up there fishing. He said, oh, it's nothing, nothing to be walking around $100 bills in your pocket up there. All the time, I, go, I keep hearing about this place, Catch a Can. He says, but you come up there, I'll cook you a steak. So we were up here, I said, I'm going to go to this place he directed me to. So I walk into the fireside, I walk into this plush, downtown San Francisco, like club. Well, what is this? The Old Elks Club, where all the magnates from these gigantic international corporations were entertaining their clients from all over the world. That was an amazing place with steam bags. Is that the right pronunciation, magnates? But so anyway, so I hang out there and Roswick's playing on the organ that we find, that came to us. Dave Rosen used to play that organ with Paul Edgman. So he's playing that. It was really cool. And then I go into the back and there's the stage. It was really nice. And then this band comes out and there's nobody there, just me. And they start playing acoustic. It was like a Tuesday night. They start playing acoustic and they're really good. It was Seraphin and Josie and what. They were really good. And then slowly people started coming. It was a Tuesday night. People started, within an you know, hour and a half, it was a Saturday night. The place was completely packed, completely, everyone dancing to every dance, running back to the table, drinking what they did just because they were so thirsty, running back at the, until 5 o'clock in the morning. Yes, this, every this, single town, night, this town would party till every, 5 in the morning Every all single the time. night except one night of the week. I think it was Monday or Sunday. But I'd never seen anything like this anywhere I'd ever lived. I couldn't believe it. So we're going to talk a bit about art, because obviously that's there's different types of art. Oh, yeah, like Why don't you tell this story real quick? Can you tell that story quick? And then we'll go okay. backwards the other direction. All right. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> I had a show in Juneau last November. At the, at my tell, tell that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of my painting, and <clears throat> I brought a few pictures at the last minute. I took some of N.J. Cato's pictures of the monument with me, just like, well, I took people what I'm doing. And Bob Banghart, who's the director of the music museum, who's an amazing violent uh, fiddle player, he took uh, Mary and I out to eat the night of the opening, Friday night. And I was talking, he says, you know, Dave, it's kind of auspicious timing, though, by the way. He said, there's this committee that's formed that wants to, for the 150th anniversary of the signing of the deed for Alaska, they want to have for the first time a statue of Seward, you know, in the state capitol, because there is none. And we want to have that be part of the ceremony. They want to have it be part of the ceremony. And, uh, this committee's coming to the museum, museum next week. And, uh, you know, on Wednesday, I'm going to bring them up and show your show. And, you know, if you have anything with the monument, I'd sure, you know, like to show them, you know, what you what you did. So I said, well, I have those pictures, and I have a few more that I didn't put out. So said, well, whatever you got, I'll show them. So that was, a, that was in January. I mean, that was in November. A year ago. Yeah, a little over a year, year, year ago. So I went back, and I never heard anything, because I was thinking, oh, it's Wednesday. The committee's there. I wonder what's happening. So in January, when I went back to pick up everything, I said, did anything ever happen with that? He says, oh yeah, they were real enthusiastic. I expect you're on the mailing list. <clears throat> so then, it's getting around, to, it's April, and 
Ray had invited me to play with the Ratfish Wranglers at the Folk Festival on Saturday night, which is a really desired spot. I also had an opportunity to play with this other band in town in the bar, the Pimentos and John Hunt, and actually get paid some money, play clarinet kind of thing, Dixieland. And I probably have to fly, which I don't like to do, and I'm going, I've just been up to Juno twice. I couldn't decide, couldn't decide. Ray asked on the weekend before, I said, hey, are you going? I go, I don't know, I can't decide. I don't know. <laughs> it's Thursday of that week, of the Saturday night, I'm going to play. And I'm sitting on the couch and going, oh, I know Sean Lee and some other people are going tonight, Thursday night. I mean, I still could go. You know, there could, and I'm going, hey, just, you're not going. Just, you're not. So I watch TV and I go, well, I'm not going. Going where? Up to Juno to play. All right. I'm going to stay, you know, on my own, do my own. So I, I got a stack of unopened mail. And I start going through this mail on Alaska Living History. Open up and I start reading this letter. But the 150th anniversary of the, I'm going, oh, this is those people. Oh, wow. We sent uh, a letter to five, targeted five artists around the United States to see if uh, they'd be interested in, in this project. My letter was actually addressed to Seward Johnson. My <laughs> sister recognized his name. He's an artist from New Jersey. He's the guy, wait, no, he did the giant statue of the sailor kissing the nurse. There's a 40-foot statue of that. Did they actually think you were Seward Johnson? Hmm. No, it was a mistake. He must have gotten my letter. But, <laughs> no, no. He's 90 years old, though. He really kind of Not much of competition. Well, he had something going in China. But, okay. <laughs> but anyway, so, and I go, <clears throat> and they go, well, if you are interested, we'd like your response, please, by March 31st. Now, the folk festival Saturday night's like April 15th. So I'm realizing, like, oh no, oh no, oh you idiot, oh my god, it's 11.30 in the morning, there's a number to call, so I push and they call, and um, uh, no, she's on the phone right now, Barbara Probst, it turns out it's the office of Mead Treadwell that I'm calling, she goes, I'll, I'll ask her to call, she'll call you back, yeah, okay, thank you, I guess at 12, it's lunchtime at home. Wait at least until one in the hopes that she's ever going to call back. One o'clock, and I'm really freaking out. Like, what an idiot. And then the, after one, the phone rang, and there was this woman, Barbara Probst, and I told her, Hi, my name's Dave Rubin. I was one of the people, you, one of the artists that you sent a letter to. I, I just opened it this morning. Is there any way I can still get my stuff to you? <laughs> she was part of it. So she goes, Well, how much time would you need? I go, well, I know today I should be able to answer, you know, tomorrow. You know, you know. I said, but if I could have till Monday, I can, she goes, okay, well, they're going to meet next week. So if you can get it here by Monday, that'd be okay. So I rushed down to the Arts Council. Help! <laughs> 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 so for, for those of you that wonder what the Arts Council does, 90% of the time is writing letters for Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I write my own letters. I write my own letters. <laughs> All right, that was an exaggeration, but, sorry. I know, but I wouldn't be at with Marnie. Marnie, Marnie, is help me at my... Can we speed this up I just know, a bit? I am, okay. I'm up. Yeah, so, okay. so, <laughs> so I get it there by Monday. I don't hear a response. I don't know if they got it. I don't know if it made it through sometime. So I, I called Bob Banger. I said, well, Dave, you can email Barbara. It's just due diligence. Find out if it made it. Because, but it's the end of the legislative session. They're probably really busy. So I finally got an email saying, yeah, it's, we've been really busy at the end of the list, they said, and uh, yes, we got it, and uh, you'll be hearing from us. So the next email was, uh, if chosen, how long would it take you, how much would you need, you know, how much would it cost? And they narrowed it down to two people by no, then? No, they said, one, that, this was a letter that you had to respond to from which they were going to choose three people. Uh -huh. So then, the next letter was, you know, how, long, how much would you need up front, and all that stuff. Luckily, I went through that other experience with the thing downtown, and now actually you're not proud of going back to them and asking for more after you're done, yeah, right? Exactly. Okay. So, 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 so anyway, so I um. So the next email was you are now one of two finalists. You know, they, I guess you just narrowed it down to two. I don't know what the response was. The other person was it turned out it was a, a Mike Garley from um, from Matsu Valley, who did a statue of a. 
of a, uh, you know, a prospector with a dog in front of him. And uh, I didn't know that at the time. And then? And, and then, so anyway, so then, you know. Well, here's the thing. Chuck and I share this thing about it has to be a story. There's a story. You have to look for the story. Well, you, you've told the story. Well, part of the idea, <laughs> okay, wait. Well, this, this, is the, this, is, this is not the drawing they saw, part of the proposal. I, I, I did get it. I did get it. But this wasn't the one. As the story continued on, one of the committee members said, he said, because the, 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 Seward left his cave in Juno. The museum has it. And I sent another alternative picture, which I said, I also know that the cape is there, and if you want him in his cape, you know, this could be an idea of what it would look like. Not this one. And I, and they, and they, I immediately said, yeah, we want him in the cape. And this guy, Carlton Smith, said, why not have it in the wind? He says, we have this wind up here. And all of a sudden, I flashed with, like, oh, yeah, like Superman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me speed this up a little bit. He was awarded the contract. I think they have some funding issues. Yeah, they're, they're raising the money, but to build this Seward statue. On oh, yeah. the, uh, right, right. I know. Go ahead. But I told Chuck, he said, I said, Chuck, I really think we're going to get it. Because I told him, I said, the, the, the base is coming from Marble Island. Anybody know about Marble Island? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, anybody know Pam and Kelly Roth? Yeah. Well, they own the part where the quarry was. And there was 18,000 pound blocks of Tokin marble, which was compared at one time to Carrara marble. Carrara was in Italy where Michelangelo's got his marble. This is the, 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 the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the Mormon State, I think born, the Montana State Capitol. And Juno. The state building in Juno, the pillars are Tokin oh, marble. Right. And I realized, holy crap. So here's, here's so, let, me tell, let me tell a little story. So I told Chuck, I think we're going to get it. Who's Chuck? Chuck. He goes, it's the story, Chuck. Who? Chuck. Remember I said, it's the story. Yes, I, I do. It's being told. I can well, I can, I'm going to tell this story because I can tell it quicker, okay. all right? So <laughs> he calls me up and says, I want to meet with Steve Seeley, who's a very dynamic businessman. He's done all sorts of things down. He wants to meet with him. He tells me he wants to meet with him to play. I, but I know him already. You know that. I know that. I know. But you wanted me to orchestrate it for some reason. Well, the, hanging out in a room with Chuck and Steve Seeley, I thought would be a milestone but he in said, my life. What he said he wanted to, to do was play a guitar with Steve, who's kind of a... Uh, plays guitar in the evening. So we go out there, Steve opens this vault, there's guns on one side, guitars on the other, and they get to chat, and I sit in the back and watch for an hour and a half, and Steve, and uh, Dave takes a guitar, he puts it in his lap, and he becomes somebody else. In other words, I know exactly. This guy's, oh, we're all going to die all the time. He put a guitar, all of a sudden he was in control of the room, he was telling Steve what to do, he was telling what song they're going to sing. It was absolutely Wait, amazing. Penny, Penny knows Steve. He was doing like, hey, you're, you're the real guitar player. All right, player. I'm he telling you what I saw. Over, you know? Anyway, this guy was in control, and at the very end, after an hour and a half of them playing folk songs together. He's great. Uh, See, can I like, tell the story? Let me finish this song. But they might not they have to know that. Okay, good. All right, so anyway, at the very end, he says, Steve, the reason I came out is I need you to take your landing craft to Marble yeah, Island right. to get a <laughs> uh, foundation for my statue. Well, Kelly said, figured out a way to get it back to town. He goes, I'll just have Steve Seeley bring some stuff out. Because they're building a house on the beach next to these blocks. And he says, I'll get Steve to, to bring out supplies for me. He can bring it back. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Anyway, my point was everything's a connection from no, Ruben. No, because what did Steve say? He goes, he goes, he goes, I tried to steal one of those blocks. I got caught. I got caught. Because he went there, to, he had a job, he goes, I'm going to get that marble that's on the beach, that Tokine marble. Because the, the mine was, it was the uh, Vermont Marble Company. They came to Alaska, they bought, there's other marble quarries in Alaska. They bought all of them, closed them down, except for this one, Marble Island. Well, we're going to get the base from there, and his name's going to be entered to it. And Gary McWilliams is going to do the work. He was the guy who owned the high, who owned the high act where tattoos stayed. Because we made an announcement to Sourdough and said, "Hey, uh, does anybody have a place we could stay? We have to, he invited us down to his high act. This bow, this like it looks like the African queen, had these four bumps in my head, and we lived on. He's going to cut this one. So Tom here's, space, a, here's, here's a, a guy that 30 years ago was questing across. The states came back to catch again so he could have his baby up here as a guitar player and now he's building sewer statues in the state of Alaska. He's from New York. He was the governor of New York. He was a senator from New York. And that's as far as I can get in one hour. <laughs> Remember how 
when you're eight years old and you're playing with your friends all day and you're running the house to get a drink of water? Slow down. What am I gonna, you're breathless. <laughs> you're running the house to get a drink of water, right? You're a breathless moment. You know, and your mom asks what you're doing. You're just rushing. You got it. There's, there's never any part of that life that you were in, in living in, where you ever asked, oh, what is my purpose? What are we all doing here? You're totally locked in. That's what I like to be. Locked in. It's not even, you know, you know what I mean? You're in the moment. It, well, yeah, they call it that. When, you know, lock, when, you know, when you're locked into the window, so you, got, you pick up a jet stream and you get locked in, or music, you get locked anything, you know. You know, it's a, a conversation, you're locked in, or a movie, you're locked in. That's what I think is the ultimate. Okay, so now, which brings us to the end of the thing, where I, I want to try to give an immediate example in the of, of, of in. that property in the universe of being locked in. So if you now could open your... your, your oh. your, 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 your
Who's the plumber? 